I really wish that I had known some of the things that I'm about to say 20, 25 years ago. Lapsing, relapse is very natural, it's very normal. You have to prepare for it because the relapse comes back and knocks you on your ass. And I love yep. working with people because I can be that person that reminds them. You got better once, you can do it again. What were some initial reactions to you being so vocal about taboo topics? My tagline for advocacy is, don't put anything out there that you're not willing to take negative feedback on. This is the sole reason I get my ass on that camera on YouTube and I do not care what comes out of my mouth. I do not care because the only people that matter are the ones out there like me when I was 20 years old lying in a creek bed waiting to die by hypothermia. Yeah. They're the only ones that matter. Welcome to another episode of the Get to Know OCD podcast. My name is Patrick McGrath. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer for NoCD. NoCD is an online platform for the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder and related conditions. You can check us out at nocd.com. If you like the Get to Know OCD podcast, subscribe to the NoCD YouTube channel. I'm very excited today to have Chrissy Hodges with me. Hi, Chrissy. Hello, thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure to do anything with NoCD. Well, thank you. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what brings you into the OCD community? Okay. Uh, I am an OCD advocate. In particular, I like to talk about pure OCD, which as we know is the community name for individuals with intrusive thoughts and mental rituals. Um, what I do for a living is I'm a certified peer support specialist in the state of Colorado. I work with people all around the world providing support in any stage of recovery that they're in. And I also do referrals for therapists so I can help people find uh, evidence-based therapists anywhere in the world. I also am the author of Pure OCD, The Inv Invisible Side of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. I run an organization called OCD Game Changers. It's a 501c3 nonprofit, and what we do is that we create opportunities in different states and also in different countries all over the world for connection for individuals with OCD. We have lived experience speakers, sometimes we have therapists that come in, but our main goal is connecting people in that community so they feel less alone. And lastly, I, um, I operate a Colorado government contract that puts peer support specialists in the state institutions. Wonderful. If your OCD were an animal, oh. What animal would it be? I should have reviewed these questions. Well, you know, <laughs> that one might not have been in the one you would have reviewed anyway because it's a surprise one. So, if yeah. my OCD were an animal, uh, I, I've, the interesting answer to that is I think that in the different stages of recovery that I've been through, yeah. it would be different types of animals. Okay. Uh, I feel like it, it was a very fierce and angry animal uh, when I was in my 20s. In my 30s, it would probably more be like a chimpanzee or a monkey, which I would look at as being like more curious mm -hmm. um, of the relationship I have with it. And um, now I would say it's like a sloth, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't really know why. It's just this 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 thing that just walks slowly alongside me, mm -hmm. um, and I. And sometimes I have to pick it up and carry it across the road, and sometimes it's just hanging there, mm -hmm. and I don't want it to be there. But um, we just have fallen into this way of knowing that we have to live together forever. I love that in the sense that sometimes people come to OCD treatment thinking successful treatment means I'll never have any intrusive thought ever again whatsoever. How can you help dispel that mm -hmm. myth? I think that this is one of the hardest things about real recovery. I would say that a majority of individuals who live with OCD that are finally at kind of this contemplation phase of getting treatment think to themselves, if I get treatment, which is also scary for people, sure. they're afraid of what's going to happen during treatment or what they're going to find out. But if it's successful, please let it be successful. successful. I will have the ability to wake up every single day and never have an intrusive thought again and life is going to be so great and I'll be happy every single day that I never have these thoughts again and <clears throat> that is what we all want. As we know, that's not the reality. No. It's not the reality of anyone's life that we can control our thoughts and that we can control the disorder. Right. Um, but what we can do is that we can manage it. 
And I think the psychoeducation uh, that all of us can provide and the, re the real recovery stories of kind of long-term recovery, not necessarily that honeymoon period afterwards where it's, oh my goodness, this theme is gone and now life is so great and it will always be like that because the relapse comes back and knocks you on your ass. And when the relapse comes, I think sometimes people forget treatment works. They forget that they got better. They forget how bad it had been before. And now they're being reminded. And there's this secondary f flow and feeling of, oh my gosh, it's, this, this is different this time. This is worse. It feels different. I'm never going to get better. Um, people often come to peer support, which is what I do, uh, in that stage. And I love working with people when they're in I don't love that stage for them, but I love yep. working with people because I can be that person that reminds them. You got better once, you can do it again. How can I support you in remembering how to do ERP? Remembering all the tools that you have. And then they're like, oh, that's right. I did get better. Um, so, you know, I want to emphasize that <clears throat> lapsing, relapse is very natural. It's very normal. You have to prepare for it. And I think in the therapeutic realm, <clears throat> often, and I know, I know that NoCD um, definitely tries to set people up with this, plus having this wonderful supportive community, but I do think in a lot of ways, <clears throat> we, don't, we, we don't get educated in our therapeutic experience of, by the way, when the relapse happens. Yeah. Because I think the therapist doesn't want the relapse to happen either, or they, you know, or this or that, but we need to start preparing people for when this comes back, here's what we can do. Almost like a wellness recovery action plan, mm -hmm. a wrap plan for OCD, um, of people being able to see on paper, here are my symptoms, here's what it felt like, here's who not to talk to, here's who to talk to, <laughs> <laughs> here's mm -hmm. what to do, kind of this SOS OCD plan, because it's always shocking. Um, but I always like to say to people, relapse is the best teacher that you can have because it reminds you that you're capable and the more that you relapse the quicker you get on top of it and the quicker you realize this is a manageable illness and I can survive with it. How has the definition of recovery changed for you over oh, the man. course of your treatment <laughs> and your experience of OCD? This is such a, an important and big question. I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and you are one of the people to really ask that question to with how open you are about what you've been through. Yeah, thank you. I'm 47 now, and in reflection, which is why I think it's so important to have these conversations now, I really wish that I had known some of the things that I'm about to say 20, 25 years ago. Um, I think that, again, the word recovery with mental health uh, can be confused with this with recovery sometimes with physical health. I'm in recovery from cancer. I'm in recovery. I'm in remission from this. And, and oftentimes we look at that as no more symptoms. We're good. We just do checkups. And if it comes back, we'll be on top of it and we're going to be okay. But usually people are very, um, oh my gosh, there's this, this relief. There's this celebration. And I think with mental health, re we, we want to think that recovery is like that as well. When, when we're done with treatment, the symptoms are completely gone, the thoughts are completely gone if we're specific to OCD. And so that's what I thought too, Patrick. I thought when I go through, I went with, through treatment with Dr. Stephen Phillipson way back in the day, uh, 1998, over the phone, because there was no internet then. There was no internet then, people. <laughs> So I had phone therapy, mm -hmm. and when I started to get better, I started to envision this life. Oh my gosh, recovery is free of this monster. It's free of all of these thoughts, and I'm going to live the best life, and I'm never going to take anything for granted again. I mean, we even think that about sore throats, right? We have sore throats, and we're like, I'm never going to take for granted swallowing again. And the, the first day you don't have a sore throat, you're like, I'm swallowing everything. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, <laughs> that's how it is with OCD, and I think what happened is, I went through the symptom recovery, and yes, it worked wonderfully. And I did have a absolute reduction in symptoms to the point where I felt like I didn't have OCD. But now we're moving into the emotional recovery. Yeah. And when I was in my 20s, there were no resources like there are now, none. And so I just thought, 
Chrissy, you just have to, you have to be grateful that you got treatment and move on with life and, and, and stop being such a baby, like pull yourself up by your bootstraps, forget about the 12 years that you were suffering in the suicide attempt and hospitalization. And now you should live life because if you keep dwelling on this, you're the one that's playing the victim. So I suffered for the next 13 years in absolute silence not telling anybody what had happened, sitting here telling myself that you need to be grateful for life and why aren't you, but then I was struggling with why am I not happy? I'm so angry, I'm so sad, I'm, I'm so sh ashamed of everything. And I also developed uh, alcohol, su uh, substance use um, issues to boot. I mean, because that's how I had to cope. I didn't want to burden my family with being like, I'm still suffering because I know they were like, okay, thank goodness yeah. that's over. Right. We're done now. Christy's better. Christy's well. And so that phase of recovery to me was, is just as important as symptom recovery, that emotional recovery, which we can talk about later. But, um, I was absent of connection to myself and to a community. So then in my thirties, um, when I relapsed with harm OCD, um, that's when it became very real to me. I wasn't getting the groinal, so I was like, this ain't OCD. Because mm -hmm. OCD comes with the groinal. <laughs> right, right. And so when I didn't get that, I was scared. This is real this time. Um, and then once I relapsed, it took me about eight weeks to get back on my feet. Um, that's when I thought, I've got to find community. And so then recovery became, what can I give back in order to help myself heal? Mm -hmm. I'm also not saying that you have to go out and start a YouTube channel <laughs> or, write a book, or do uh, any yeah. of that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. for me, it was, there was nothing back then. This was mm -hmm. like 12 years ago. There was nothing on pure OCD and this stuff that I talk about on my channel and this stuff that people talk about now. So I just thought I can fill that niche. And in the mean, and this was very selfish. I was like, I can fill that niche, but also find people mm -hmm. to help me connect back to myself and connect to others. So my recovery then became very much I'm going to live with this the rest of my life. That's what relapse taught me. I'm going to live with this the rest of my life, but how do I make it manageable? And I knew I couldn't do it alone. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the 2013 IOCDF conference. That's where I met Margaret Sisson. I met Riley Sisson. I met, um, you know, Jeff Bell, all of these people that were doing this wonderful advocacy. And that's when the real healing began. Yeah. It really began that way. Symptoms were managed, but the healing became began with healing the shame, and heal and you know ex getting away from that isolation and finding other people that can help me feel like I'm a normal human being, and I'm worthy and deserving. And that took about 15 years, but here we are. <laughs> the worthy and deserving point. Yeah, <laughs> I can finally say I am, but yeah, it's taken quite some time. You are known for the pure OCD work, right? Yes. And also, uh, the YouTube channel is out there in the sense, and I mean this in the best way possible. <laughs> it's okay. I take it as a compliment. It is. Uh, <laughs> you talk about the taboo stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that was probably pretty shocking for a lot of people at first. What were some initial reactions mm -hmm. to you being so vocal about taboo topics in OCD. It's interesting that you bring this up because I was having a conversation with my friend Margaret this morning <laughs> about <laughs> this very thing. Um, I think that, and I, I, I may just be making an assumption here, but I think that even still today, there's still some, whoa, this girl is talking about a lot of things that just aren't talked about in general. Right. Wor I mean, words that are just inflammatory. You know, we're talking pedophilia, masturbation, pornography. You know, I talk about all of the things that I feel like no one else is willing to say because of the fear of the backlash. Right. But I also do think that back then and even now, it's coming from a woman, which I think is in, in a, one that's not a clinician. Mm -hmm. I'm a peer sport specialist, right? And so I do think to some degree, people are a little, okay, you know, not that they're not taking me seriously, but I do think that in a, in a way, it's that we still have this idea of A, we don't talk about those topics. B, if we do talk about those topics, it better be someone clinical and not like kind of laughing sometimes like I do, just <laughs> humor to bring to the channel when we're talking about porn. Yeah. Um, but 
Not that porn's funny. But anyway, um, <laughs> but, but also because I'm a woman. Mm-hmm. And so here's a, a woman talking about these things as well. And we don't often see that unless they're a sex therapist or unless they're in that role. Yeah. And so I, do, I have felt some personal pressure around it, but my loyalty is to the community. Sure. And so in reality, everybody can fuck off that doesn't like it <laughs> because the community needs to hear what I have to say. You know, at first, yes, it was very stressful. The first time I dropped a pedophilia themed OCD video, it was probably the first video ever on YouTube about it. It was, gosh, it was like eight years ago. And Patrick, I sat down in my apartment at that point. I pointed the camera. I was basically like, nobody in the comments better say anything. I mean, there's a stern warning. I was scared. Sure. I posted the video, shut the computer, went and ate sushi, went out and had a strawberry martini, <laughs> and didn't open my computer until two days later because mm-hmm. I didn't want to see. Yeah. But there was nothing. Okay. Because the community needed to hear it. The only thing that there was was excitement that people were finally talking about this, tears, because people finally felt like they, were, th- they weren't alone in this. And so that gave me the courage to do a video on OCD and addiction and then OCD and pornography, and then, o- and then talking about masturbation as a compulsion. These things that not everyone will talk about. Yeah. And so from there, and, and in the last couple of years, of not only my videos, but in general, my advocacy, everything comes straight from the mouths of my clients. I obviously don't quote them because of HIPAA, <laughs> but anything that they're talking about, I post about because sure. my entire life and advocacy is wrapped up in meeting the needs of the community. What is the community telling you these days? Is, are there any new trends that are coming up? So I recently started doing some videos. Uh, the trends kind of come for me <laughs> when I decide to boldly post something that I would never post. <laughs> and so all of a sudden now to there's boldly post. <laughs> a plethora of things yeah. on the mm-hmm. queue that I need yeah. to post about. So um, recently, and, and this has also um, come because I have created um, in my practice um, eight-week closed support groups where people can get to know each other over eight weeks and we discuss different topics so people get very vulnerable and I also have a, a, a private online community people can join okay same thing support groups stuff like that but in these two things this is where I get the most feedback because people feel safe comfortable and it's confidential and they know that that information is going to get out, out to expose what they're going through so I hear a lot of the stuff like when things happen when you were younger like child's play things like that and now my OCD is latched onto something that's happened when I was a child because me and my cousin kissed when we were three or you know you know sister showed me her boobs when Mm -hmm. she was seven and I you know and now now I'm having incest uh, intrusive thoughts or now I'm having pedophilia intrusive thoughts because it suddenly happened out of my control when I was a child things like that so when I started posting some of these videos which Mm -hmm. as you know you never see that shit Mm -hmm. anywhere Mm -hmm. (laughs) I thought it was important because I was hearing these stories so much. So then when I post that kind of video, now all of a sudden I'm getting clients coming to me because they know I'm safe. And I am. I'm a peer support. I'm bound by HIPAA. You know, anything that they say to me. And of course I'm going to meet them with empathy because of I'm course. meeting all of these people all over the world that are experiencing this. So from there, then we're going to go to another. T- so now we're going to focus on false memory. And now we're going to focus on real event. And then, you know, sometimes people bring up abuse and things like that that also impacts their OCD. So what's trending for me more now is just everything taboo under the belt. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, it's it's and I am happy to play that role because I have no shame in posting that stuff. I'm not worried about getting canceled. I'm not worried about the public. I'm not I can take the heat. I've been doing it for long enough. Um, And so it's a privilege to be able to share that with others. Yeah, and I appreciate that, and I hope that more people do that. But we've also seen backlash against other people. You know, there was someone recently who posted about pedophilic OCD, and some influencer saw it and found out and sick their two million followers on them, and they mm-hmm. they went away for a year. Right? They just wanted to hide. So, uh, there's I mean, I think that when I hear when I hear something like that, um, again, you know, if, I think it's important when you if and if you want to become an advocate, if you want to get out there and speak about some of these things, 
yeah, you're going to get backlash and you're going to yep. have people writing to you saying you should go kill yourself. Yep. I mean, I get that all the time and I'm like, delete block, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't even care. Like, my, Because I'm loyal to the community. Right. I mean, for me, if someone were to put me center stage on something and say, sick this girl, I'd be like, come sick me. Mm -hmm. Because right now, I don't care about the two million people telling me to go kill myself. I'm caring about the 10,000 people that are like, oh my God, this girl is saying exactly what I'm going through and I was going to kill myself this weekend. They yeah. are who I care about. That's right. Right? Yeah. No, I don't I, care about the heat. It doesn't matter. So if you're going to be an advocate, and w this is what I always tell people, my tagline for advocacy is don't put anything out there that you're not willing to take negative feedback on. Ever. Because it's, it's coming. Yeah. Why advocacy? What, what got you into being a pure advocate? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I even struggle with calling myself an advocate. Um, I'm certainly not an influencer. Like, that term makes me want to just blow my house up. Um, but I, I think I, I fell into it. I mean, again, you know, 10, 10, 14, 10, 12 years ago, there was nothing, there was nothing on the internet, Patrick, talking about this stuff. And so my, my goal wasn't, I'm going to get on, I'm going to get on and become an advocate. It was, I'm going to get on and find these people. I wanted to find these people. Yeah. I knew they were out there because I'd read Phillipson's like, he, he has all these graduate stories. So I knew there were people out there and I thought, I'm just going to put this out there and see. And then all of a sudden, people are going, oh my goodness, this and this and this, which motivated me to do more. Um, I will say, I got a good, and I would encourage anybody that wants to do advocacy, is that do it local. Do it in your local community too, because doing it online is just a different beast. But locally, you really can see the impact and the influence of it. So for uh, several years, I did local activism for the mental health community, meaning I went and spoke to the, st the Senate and the House advocating for certain bills that were going to pass um, that were for you know justice issues for people with mental health and that really what kind of put me on this path of thinking I really was an advocate I really mm -hmm. can make a difference um, and then now um, I think I don't really look at the title of like oh Chrissy's an advocate I mean I I, I just want I just want to be part of this community and and all honesty, I just I want to be seen as an equal in the community, as someone who still struggles with OCD sometimes, um, is still working on my own recovery and whatever tools other people can offer me and vice versa, we just continue to walk alongside together. I think that'd be great. Yeah, mm -hmm. I hope that continues to happen. Mm -hmm. As you meet people, I'm sure you meet people who were misdiagnosed <laughs> and you dealt with that as well too. Uh, tell me about the, the passion that you have for, for those who are scared to come out and tell their story because of shame and guilt. You know, the DSM definition of OCD says it's anxiety mm -hmm. or distress. It doesn't talk about guilt mm -hmm. and shame and disgust no, and all those things, but it, it ought to. So ought to. how did those experiences, those emotions influence you and the work that you did? That's a great question. So I'll, I'll just speak from my own lived experience first. I think that one of the confusing things about OCD and intrusive thoughts and mental rituals, which I'm just gonna refer to as pure OCD, even though we know it's not a diagnosis, it's just a community name. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things about pure OCD is it isn't just about anxiety when it comes to taboo intrusive thoughts. Right. We're more dealing with shame, we're more dealing with guilt and disgust, sadness, that my life can never be the same and, and that things are taken away from me. I'll never, you know, I can see this life, but I can't get to it. Um, things like that. And so when we're, I think people and myself, especially recently, I, I've had OCD over the last five or six years about some physical stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't anxiety for me. Yeah. It was sadness. Okay. You never see that talked about you never and, and and I've started to learn this more when especially when it comes to like pedophilia incest bestiality is that people are experiencing shame over anxiety and um, gui sense. guilt yeah. over mm -hmm. anxiety I mean anxiety might be there sure. but like the primary emotion that's pulling them in are these and so then they think well it's not OCD because I don't have like the classic anxiety things like that and that's how I felt um, so I think that we need more um, we, we need more information and education on 
how OCD can show up for individuals. And I think that that's where the therapeutic intervention can get a little wonky for people because it's very much this, um, I'm just making a broad generalization here, yeah, sure. but <laughs> a lot of times it is this, well, here's how symptoms show up and, he, and, and here, you know, here's usually what you have and here's this and this and this. And as we know, people with OCD, if they don't fit in the beautifully cut box, they are going to go, this box is not for me and I must be this horrible person over here. And right. they're always going to go that way. And so we have yeah. to get, a, I feel like um, if we're looking very much at the recovery model, then we're looking at individualized treatment for people based on what they have gone through, of course with evidence-based tools, but also it not being so rigid and it also not being, well, if you're not doing the exposures, you're not gonna get better. I hear that a lot mm -hmm. from people, that that's what they've heard from their therapist and it's just, no, because in research in the last couple of years, we are, we're even starting to see that shame is a barrier mm -hmm. to treatment. So if we don't, if therapists aren't working on the shame, if they're not, you know, even doing that beforehand or alongside ERP, then people aren't gonna get better and or they're not even gonna engage in treatment. Mm -hmm. So this is where, I don't even think I talked about my experience. I just went off on something. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> mm -hmm. this is where um, peer support is so important. And I, I do want and hope that therapists will utilize peer support, whether it's myself and my practice or other people that are certified. There are several people in the community that are certified peer support specialists that can help. Um, peer support is something that can help with motivation to do treatment. Uh, motivation to even reach out for treatment because when you see someone else who has experienced these major emotions that are attached to OCD, major barriers that were attached to recovery or even getting treatment and you see, wow, that girl, she's living a good life and she had the same obsessions that I did. If she can do it, I can do it. That's what we want. If she can do it, I can do it. Even if everything in your brain is screaming, but you're different and it's not OCD. Everything in my brain screams, I'm different and it's not OCD. So then now I can normalize that for them. I'm not reassuring them. I'm giving them that first time assurance of like, you are no different than anybody. And let me walk with you yeah. as you go through this, because it's going to get scary, mm -hmm. but you don't have to do it alone. OCD does love to attack things that you love, that are important to you. One of the questions that I get on my weekly webinars is why does it have to do that? Why can't it be anything but this thing? How do you, how do you reply to that when people <laughs> when people say that to you? Because I'm sure you hear that too. I mean, if it attached to squash for me, then I wouldn't give a shit because right. I hate squash. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> and you wouldn't come to me for say I need therapy about my squash uh, obsessions, right? We we wouldn't be doing that, would we? Yeah. No, uh -huh. I mean, that's, that was a joke, but still, I but mean, it, not, but it's true. It, it is true. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things, uh, one of the things that I've learned, especially in the last five or six years in dealing with other themes is that we with OCD also, even when we're in symptom recovery, we tend to have this baseline of everything is okay here. Mm -hmm. Meaning like, here's my life. And I woke up today and it's like, Oh no, I have a slight headache, cancer, mm -hmm. you know, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or I have mm -hmm. a little bit of nausea, vomit, mm -hmm. you know, so we tend to like need to be in this area right here. Mm -hmm. And when anything gets even a little wonky, all of a sudden we're, you know, and that's what we have to monitor here and there. So when we're in that baseline are all the things that make us feel okay yeah. and normal, whether that's like my relationship with my friends or my, my partner, Joe, or like my ability to go run because that's the thing that I love or, you know, my ability to eat sushi, you know, because I love sushi and we're going to eat that tonight, mm -hmm. you know, and all the, and my ability to travel. So all these things that make my life wonderful. So when any of those things get at all knocked off, then it's all of a sudden like, oh my God, please don't take this away from me because this is the one thing that makes me feel good. Yeah. You know, or this is part of what, and I can't go. So there we go. That is exactly what happens. It's like laser focused. Oh, yes. there it is. Yeah. Please mm -hmm. don't take this away from me because yes. this is the one thing that I need. And now we're spinning into, I'll never be able to exist if I can't run again. Yeah. Which by the way, this is what I have dealt with in the last five years is that I've had some foot injuries and I battled with OCD. It wasn't the injury, 
it was the, what if I can never do this again and now my life is over and that sadness was pervasive. I've never experienced that with OCD before. And we don't talk about physical, physical things a lot with OCD, but it's very common. It's yeah. just that people don't talk about it a lot. So when that was taken, so here's my baseline. Mm -hmm. I run, check. I do this, check, th check, check, check. When that was taken for me, it's like OCD came in and stopped me and just spun yeah. on top of that baseline. Spun, and I was stuck so tight. It wound me up so tight, and I suffered and suffered trying to get that back, trying to get that back. And it's like I would get here, and I couldn't grab onto it. And just the depression and the sadness around that, it was it was crippling at times um and i couldn't recognize it as ocd until i realized it was the sadness that was drawing me in instead okay. of the anxiety yeah, yeah and the compulsions the other thing that i hear and i'd love you to address this too is people will say to me why does it have to feel so real <laughs> yeah why does it patrick well i say this all the time <laughs> If, if it didn't feel real, you wouldn't be coming in for treatment because you'd be going, oh, I have this, but it, but it doesn't feel real, so I'm moving on. Yeah. I mean, OCD knows that in order to get you to do a compulsion, it's got to feel like you really need to do it. Yes. Because otherwise you won't do it because OCD eats compulsions for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. So. Well, so this is what I tell people, and this is what I remind myself when it feels so real, yeah. is it is real. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then mm -hmm. they say, wait a minute, you mean my themes? And yeah. I'm like, hold on. Oh, oh. mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I usually give a little warning before. I'm yeah. like, I'm going to say something, but just hang on. It is real. Mm -hmm. It is our brain's natural response to a threat. Yeah. So everything in our central nervous system is warning us. Yep. And that anxiety is designed to get you to move. Yep. Let me get up and do something because you're in trouble. Yep. And so when it feels that way, now it's, oh my gosh, I have to solve this. But I, I, this is the example I always use. But if I'm in, laying in bed and I hear somebody breaking into my house, I'm going to get up and move because my central nervous system is like, threat, threat, get up. I don't know if I'm going to move, grab a baseball bat, or get under the bed. Mm -hmm. I don't have any choice over that. But then once the threat subsides, I find out it was just a bear or something, which a bear is not, you know, probably worse than an intruder. But still, <laughs> <laughs> I find out it's that. Now I'm calm. Now yeah. I'm, okay, we're all right. Now my emotions come back. Now I'm back online. Okay, what do I need to do? I'm going to go check, make sure there's everything. I'm gonna take some time to calm down because it was a real threat. Yeah. When it's OCD, it's not a threat. There is no come down. You're still trying to solve it. And the more you try to solve it, compulsions, yep. the bigger the threat becomes in your brain that's not real. And so then it needs to make it feel even more real. Enter the groinal. <laughs> and, and, or any other. Enter yeah. the pain in the head if you yeah. think you have a tumor. Enter right. anything that's now going to double down to get you to move. Right. That's why, because it is real. Yeah. And it will be relentless in getting you to move. Oh. That, that's what people will say, and I felt this when I went through it with OCD, is I just don't understand. It is 24-7 now. Yep. I am in the dark hole. Yep. I'm in the, I'm the, I'm the haze. Mm -hmm. It's blurred life. Well, that's because OCD now is warning you 24-7 of the non-threat because you're feeding it 24-7 with the compulsions. For your own treatment, I could see that as being one of the hardest things to do in therapy is to allow that feeling to be there but not scratch that itch right just to mm -hmm. just to let yes. that be there and learn as real as that feels i can handle it mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i i'd love to hear your opinion i i use the sometimes example of virtual reality mm -hmm. we could be standing in this room right now you know there's a floor under us you're not going to fall but i put a vr headset on you and there's a cliff in front of you and you'll probably scream mm -hmm. or take a step back mm -hmm. right even though you know it's not real logically that doesn't really matter and so that's where i wanted to get with this mm -hmm. we know that people with ocd have good logic mm -hmm. if only logic OCD doesn't matter was a logical <laughs> problem right so logic is the problem yeah, go take it <laughs> i mean take it. because mm -hmm. logic gets in the way of yeah. understanding that this is a behavioral problem yeah. mm -hmm. and that we don't know how to speak behavior right 
Exactly. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I say this a lot to people. I say, you can't read a book and learn how to ski. Yeah. You know, you're going to read a book and be like, oh, I think I have it. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that I'm going to turn that edge and that I'm going to do this. And then you get on the ski slope and you bust your ass all the way down and like, I don't understand why I can't ski. I read about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Because you can't logic skiing. Yeah. You have to behave your skiing, yeah. right? And so ERP is learning behavior. It's learning the language of behavior. Because when you learn the language of behavior, you're communicating now directly to OCD. Yeah. And so in my own therapy, the most terrifying thing, other than Philipson saying, you're not going to know your sexual orientation by the end of this treatment. That was the number one scary thing. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, tell me what it is. Mm -hmm. The second thing was... Chrissy, it's going to take you a little bit and you have to practice. And if you don't practice, you're not going to get better. Mm -hmm. But let's look at this with the same thing with skiing. Mm -hmm. You have to practice skiing to get better. Mm -hmm. You have to practice for your mind and your body to, com to, to learn how to do it. So now you don't have to think about it. It's like riding a bike. You know, you, you can not ride a bike for 20 years and then you pick up the, the bike and your, your mind and your body remember how to do it. Your mind doesn't. It's the combination of the two. And this is what ERP is. So for me, when I practiced and I was rigid about it, not compulsive, I did ERP at the same time every single day. I did exactly what he told me for the duration. And I started to look at the patterns of the day and the week before, during, and after. What's my pattern? The week. What part of the week was I super anxious? Then when it did, it did it get a little bit better and then it wasn't bad at all. And then all of a sudden it's horrible because I know I'm going to see him on Monday and he's going to give me something else torturous to do. Right. But once I figured those patterns out, I thought, oh my God, this is predictable. And so I, mm. but it was the rigid practice and the ability of me to let go and experience it for what it was instead of for what I wanted it to be. Yeah. I didn't want the anxiety. I didn't no. want any of it. But Philipson was, he was so pointed of like, you have to be willing to just allow anything to happen and trust that what I'm telling you is that you're going to be okay. And I was like, it's go time. Yeah. And I got better relatively quickly. Yeah. I love what you said about predictable because that is something that I push with patients all the time. When I'm working with my members, we talk about this idea that OCD can only do what OCD does because it's in the nature of OCD to do it. Right. It, it doesn't pivot. <laughs> it doesn't. It, it doesn't decide, well, today I'll let that one pass. <laughs> it's fine. You know. No. OCD follows the nature of OCD and can only Correct. do what OCD does. So people will ask, how do you know how to treat OCD? And I'll say, because I know how predictable OCD is, so I know what to do. Because I know where OCD is going to go. Why? Because OCD is predictable. And so I would, I would like to add to that, that's why ERP is so important. Yes. Because when it's not predictable, when your central nervous system is acting up, you can't predict shit when your central nervous is acting up, right? right. Because you're so, like we said before, you're in action. I gotta mm -hmm. do something to call. But when you do ERP, now you're in control. Mm -hmm. Even if you've, even if you're not having a good day or you feel anxious, it's still on your terms. Mm -hmm. I'm now activating the system because I'm allowing it to at 9 a.m. for 30 minutes, right? And so now I'm in control. Whether OCD shows up or not, you know, I'm still going to do this. And I do want to say I have a lot of empathy for people who are scared to do ERP because they don't want to suffer anymore by doing the ERP that day. I'm feeling good today. And so I don't want to do ERP because I don't want to suffer. But I also always say to people, you can either allow OCD to come in by opening the door yeah. or keep the door closed, hide behind it until OCD breaks it down because yeah. it's coming in mm -hmm. <laughs> whether you want it to or not. And that's the predictability part. Yeah. You want OCD on your own terms, not on OCD's terms, mm -hmm. meaning I know at certain times of the month I'm going to be triggered. And so if I wake up and go, well, I have PMS this week, so I hope OCD doesn't show up. I'm screwing myself. Pretty much. Yep. <laughs> now I can say, I know OCD is going to be high this week, so I'm going to go ahead and prepare for that. I actually might do some ERP each day just to get my mind remembering, like riding the bike, remembering how we speak to each other behaviorally. Recognize your patterns daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. 
because it's the denial that OCD is going to show up that really puts you in the danger path of relapse. Yeah. 20 years from now, what do you want to be known as having accomplished in your career? Um, like, am I still going to be alive in 20 years? How old will I be? Yeah, <laughs> 67. Um, uh, I've already accomplished what I want. Good. So I don't need anything else. Everything is icing then. Mm -hmm. Everything is icing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've accomplished connection, um, putting my lived experience out, talking about things that people are unwilling to talk about, and connecting with some of the greatest people on earth and knowing that they have helped me and I have helped them. I don't need any more than that. That, it, that has filled my cup. How has OCD affected family life for you. I oh, know Lord. from previous discussions, <laughs> you know, who will accept OCD, who will not, how will parents, siblings, aunts and uncles, people react to it. In previous discussions I've done, some people say, you're just being histrionic and wanting attention and all of these things. What, what's it like to kind of go from that to finally getting a diagnosis and being able to recognize, oh, there really is a name for this and an explanation for everything. Well, in my experience with living with OCD, I lived for 12 years without telling anyone in my family what was going on. And that in itself speaks volumes mm -hmm. to how I was raised. Mm -hmm. Which I also think that nurture piece has a lot to do with OCD um, and the development and and um, the development per se of when it occurred and maybe even some of the themes. We don't know any of that stuff right now, but um, there's a lot of childhood stuff that I think that got me to a position where I, did, I felt like I could not talk about it and then felt like my only way out was suicide mm -hmm. when I was 20. Um, and so when I was initially I was admitted to the hospital and I had to have surgery after suicide and was hospitalized um, involuntarily. And the shame that that brought on me and the shame that it brought on my family. Mm -hmm. um, and we can say, you know, oh, they shouldn't feel shame. But I mean, and it was, it was in the 90s too. It was very different back then. Sure. Uh, I would say that my family did uh, the best that they could to support me. Um, I will highlight my sister was, she, she was very supportive in the best way that she could, but mainly because I think that she was struggling with her own stuff around anxiety. I don't know a lot about it, but that it, she was, she was one of those people that was very welcoming and open. Um, and then my parents did the best that they could. Yeah. And they, in the way of well, you've got a diagnosis now, let's get you treatment, let's get you better, and let's never talk about it again. Yeah. And I understand that. Sure. I, I can, you know, I, I can understand that this was very scary for a family that, <laughs> for a family that I, I think that the messaging to everybody in the family was, no one in this family is mentally ill. <laughs> but see, now I'm mentally ill mm -hmm. in the family and seem to be the only one still. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So <laughs> I am the identified patient. Yeah in the family system yeah. and that's okay. And I actually, th there was freedom in understanding that. There was freedom in understanding that my ability to um, mentally break down all the way, find a diagnosis, find treatment, get better, even, even struggling through my 20s and 30s, and then finding out I have childhood trauma and taking the initiative to go deal with that, which also helped my OCD. But let me explain. It was not trauma therapy for my OCD. It yeah. was trauma therapy separate that helped me to understand myself and my relationship to OCD better mm -hmm. and therefore helped me be able to manage it more. Um, I have done the, all of my career and everything I've accomplished up to this point by myself. And I'm very proud of that. Me too. With the support mm -hmm. of so many wonderful friends and people who believed in me from day one and they are my family. Yeah, you have an amazing extended family. I do, mm -hmm. I do. I'm very lucky, including you. <sighs> Honored to be part of that. <laughs> there are people out there now, 
to this day still contemplating suicide because of OCD, because of the intrusive thoughts. What is your message to that? I just felt myself get so fired up. Like I felt it, like someone lit a match inside of me, by the way, when you said that. Because this is my driving force. Mm -hmm. My driving force is at 3 a.m. wake up thinking, who's out there right now? And then I read articles sometimes about people and it's just like this person had everything. They were, they were smiling, they were this and this, and, the, and the, they died by suicide, and no one knows why. And I think to myself, oh my God, did they have POCD, <sighs> right? The, these are the nightmares that I have about this. So Patrick, this is the sole reason I get my ass on that camera on YouTube and I do not care what comes out of my mouth. I don't care how ridiculous it sounds, how People may think that girl should not be saying that out loud. I do not care because the only people that matter are the ones out there like me when I was 20 years old, yeah. lying in a creek bed, waiting to die by hypothermia. Yeah. They're the only ones that matter. So whatever I have to say to reach these people, whatever, if I have to put, if you think you're a pedophile, you might have OCD. If I have to, you know, put that on billboards across the <laughs> United States, I don't have the money for that yet. But maybe one day. That's what I want to do because I don't care who thinks I'm nuts for saying the things that I do because the only people that matter are the ones contemplating suicide, but they don't have to. And thank you for that because there are things I can say as a clinician, but... Of course have a different meaning when they come from someone with a lived experience as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important. And vice versa. Yeah. That's why we rely on one another. Mm -hmm. For those who aren't at that level, who aren't feeling suicidal, but are contemplating, should I do treatment? I don't know. Should I talk about this? What do you say to them? So, you know, pre-contemplation, contemplation, contemplation <laughs> <laughs> all of that. I, I mean, I know you're scared. That's what I want to say. If they were sitting in front of me, I would say, I know you're scared. And you have reason to be. You've been lied to by your brain <laughs> for probably years at this point. You can't trust your own brain. And in turn, you're scared to find out there's some truth about yourself. That, you, that you're going to find out that you are an awful person. You're going to find out there are core fears or that, you're, that the core fears are real and that you're a monster. But... Wouldn't you rather take the risk that even there's a slight possibility that you'll find out you aren't mm -hmm. <laughs> and you are going to be okay and none of these things are real mm -hmm. and you can live a, a productive life managing this disorder in your hands. Contemplate that risk yeah. and then let's talk next week. That's what I tell people. Yeah. I think many people are familiar from watching this, the definition of OCD, intrusive thoughts, images, and urges, mm -hmm. relieved by compulsions, but momentarily, and then that cycle goes over. I sometimes call it the hamster wheel of hell, where it just goes and goes, <laughs> right? And it just, you are stuck, and that hamster is running and running and running. And we talk a lot, too, about how it can attack the things that you love or the things that you think would be what could be the worst thing ever to think of, mm -hmm. and it's that. And for a lot of people, uh, the, the ways that I see that coming about could be either scrupulosity, where it's about morals or ethics or religion, and it could also be about pedophilic OCD mm -hmm. or POCD as well, too. And you've talked a lot about yes. that, so that's the one that I wanted to see. Could you just kind of tell people a little bit about what that is and maybe what the experience of that is like? Yes. Uh, taboo intrusive thoughts are something that I really like to talk about the most. Um, and I define taboo intrusive thoughts as um, basically inflammatory words you would not find yourself saying very loudly in a cafe. Yeah. Pedophilia, <laughs> bestiality, yeah. incest, necrophilia, mm -hmm. <laughs> things like that that when, you're, when you say them, people usually lower their lower. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and you lower your voice because it's so inflammatory because people are going to have a reaction to these things, right? right? So when individuals have, are, are fixated on themes around these taboo intrusive thoughts, especially pedophilia, because we, we are programmed at birth of like pedophilia is bad, they're awful, they're, you know, people should just string them up, all this stuff. So we have this, everybody has a, a reaction to the word pedophilia. 
Yeah. Everybody, an inflammatory reaction. And so when individuals have intrusive thoughts about pedophilia, a lot of times in just, just, just for those of you watching, just because I don't mention how it happened to you doesn't mean that you don't have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but a lot of times people will, um, just for example, there's a cute little kid. Oh my gosh, look how cute that kid is. Oh my, I bet she's going to be beautiful when she grows up. Why would you think that about a three-year-old? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so, I'm so disgusting. Mm -hmm. um, oh my gosh, look how cute that little, look at that little butt if it's mm -hmm. a baby. Yeah. Oh my gosh, why did I just look at the baby's butt? Yeah. You know, I'm changing, I, I'm changing a diaper, um, male or female, you know, changing a diaper, and all of a sudden, you know, did I touch my child inappropriately? You know, or someone might hug their niece or nephew and all of a sudden they feel, oh my gosh, did I just feel aroused? Why would I feel aroused? Now, so this is no different than any other theme other than the shame and the guilt. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to taboo intrusive thoughts, especially pedophilia, the shame is so pervasive. Yeah. Just from the idea of having the thought, the images that might come along with it, the duration of time that they may uh, live with this theme before they tell someone because the fears are, what if I tell someone and the therapist doesn't believe me yep. and they call the cops? Yep. What if my kids get taken away? What if I go to jail? Um, and then, of course, when you're having physical sensations, like you, you can absolutely have a sexual and harm intrusive thoughts. They may think, because I'm having the groinal, which is you know the arousal non-concordance, this means it's real, and right. now I am a monster. And even you know, even if it was OCD, I'm not going to be. I don't even want to live after having some of these images. So see all the places that the shame and guilt can come in. Yeah. Th this is where people are even just scared to type into the computer. Yeah. Am I a pedophile? Fears that the computer's going to be flagged. They're going to you know the FBI is going to break down. The SWAT team is going to come in. So this is, this is what keeps me up at night. How many people are living with this theme and they're too scared to even type it in the computer? Because if they did, one of my videos would probably pop up. <laughs> and then yeah. they would be like, oh my God, what? And then, we, and then we go on to the next stage. How do we get someone to therapy? So this is what I do a lot in peer support is just supporting people. My biggest group is the POCD group. Yeah. And people, like eight week commitment, people come in there, they learn that there are normal people around the world that have this thing, we're not monsters walking around, and that people have gotten treatment, people have had kids, people work in jobs with kids, and it is possible. Thank you. And the sum of all of that is OCD game changers, and the yes, peer support is. work, and the work with the government and everything. Mm -hmm. What are you most proud of, of in, in all of that? Um, what am I the most proud of? Ooh, that's a tough question because I have self-esteem issues. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, nothing, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Pause for therapy session. Uh, no, tell me more. No. <laughs> um, I'm proud that I, through everything, that I have stayed true to making this about the community and not about me. Mm -hmm. And that there have been times that I have made it about me because there are times that we all do and there are times that I have needed that to boost my worth. Um, but for some reason I'm feeling a little emotional right now and I don't know why, but I think in the, in the last couple years of really doing some extreme healing on my own trauma to be able to meet people where they're at and just have watched them heal, bringing people together at OC Game Changers and watching the room, you saw it in Germany, just watching people have these aha moments mm -hmm. just by seeing Stephen Smith sharing a story and sweating through his vest. It was a warm, warm <laughs> room there. Yeah. He was nervous too. But <laughs> seeing these people share these stories and giving them hope i i my advocacy has really changed in the way that all that matters is bringing people together because that was the hardest part of my recovery in the symptom and the emotional was being alone mm -hmm. and so it's i am proud of my board on ocd game changers i'm proud of everybody that's ever worked with me and all of my ventures that we just all we want to do is connect people and let them know they're not alone because that's what gives us hope. Yeah. 
And that's what motivates people to go to treatment and to keep pushing in recovery. Boy, it was going to end there, but I have one other thing now. <laughs> OCD does not care about you, your friends, your family, your well-being. It only cares about itself. It's one of the most selfish things I've ever seen. And it's very convincing. And when it's trying to really grab up, because like you said, to, to kind of bring this full circle, you've done great in treatment, but you still have moments. You still have relapses oh, yeah. and oh, everything. Yeah. What is your advice to yourself to walk through all of that? This is gonna be an interesting answer. <laughs> But when you said that, uh, I feel emotional again. I'm really sorry. This has been an emotional weekend. <laughs> <laughs> when you said that OCD is selfish and OCD does this and this and this, um, I've evolved. God, sorry. I've evolved into, like when you said that I could see myself in OCD mm -hmm. as this young child. Mm -hmm. that had to be selfish, that had to, to do everything that I could to survive emotionally. And I had to show up for myself and I had to be, I did, you know, I was emotionally unstable at times, just surviving Chrissy, mm -hmm. right? And I, I sometimes think that that's what OCD is like, is that that's me. And it's that part of me that is just so scared all the time. And it's just like trying to grab onto anything and so for me now, I could not have said this 10 years ago, probably not even five years ago. OCD is part of me. It's a dark part of me, but it's still not unlovable part of me because it is something that has made me into who I am. Mm -hmm. It is something that contributes to every day of my life, every rumination moment that I have, which is a lot, um, but even rumination, it can be the devil, but it's a safety blanket for me, right? And so I think now it's kind of like in that movie, A Beautiful Mind with the individual that has schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And there's like the, at the end of the movie, he's walking along and he can see the delusions and he can see them. I feel like that's what I do with OCD. It walks alongside me and I just acknowledge it I see that it has made me who I am, it has made this beautiful life for me. Yeah. I don't want to engage with it though, but I can still see it and recognize that it is part of me. So here's what's fascinating. You don't know this because you haven't done a therapy session with me. I use that exact example in my therapy you sessions. You do? Every time. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. Use that exact same example. So. We were meant to be here. We were. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. It was awesome. Always. I so much appreciate you and I know you know that yeah and thank all of you for watching the get to know OCD podcast today if you're looking for help with OCD check us out at nocd.com and if you want to see more of the work we're doing subscribe to the nocd YouTube channel thanks we'll see you again soon